Today is Monday, where we look at the Bible. We continue our study in the book of Acts. Today, going through Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 21. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings, of your grace, and by your holy scriptures knowledge of eternal life. We pray that you enlighten us by your Holy Spirit as we study your word. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Acts chapter 2 verses 14 to 21. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you, and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that every one who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Beginning with verse 14, Peter uh, begins to speak. Now, we have talked about how Peter has taken the reins of leadership after Jesus has ascended into heaven. And Luke, who wrote this book of the Bible, says that Peter stands up with the eleven, so the other apostles. Now, there's some uh, debate or difference in interpretation in uh, the book of Acts and elsewhere in the New Testament as to who is given authority to proclaim the gospel and to carry out the office of the ministry. So in chapter 1, we, taught, we saw how there were about 120 of the people in verse 15. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And then uh, we talked last week about uh, the Holy Spirit coming upon them and uh, divided tongues as a fire resting upon each of their heads. And verse 4, they began, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. So there's some uh, debate about who this applied to. Was it all of them, all 120 of them, which included the apostles and then other disciples, men and women who were followers of Jesus, or was it just the, uh, the apostles? So there are two things that I believe that make it clear that this was a gift imparted to the apostles and not to the entire group. One is verse 11, sorry, verse 14, where it says Peter was standing with the 11. So this shows that the, the declaration of salvation was, the proclamation was given by the apostles. And the second thing is a, a, a reading of the book of Acts alongside the epistles in the New Testament, where in the book of Acts you see 
some instances of, of miraculous actions being done by uh, mostly the apostles, but also some other people. And then when you couple that with the epistles and you see that the norm now is going to be that the, the gospel ministry is going to be carried out by those who hold the office of the ministry, which at that time was the apostles, and then as they began to appoint pastors, and they then carried out the office of the ministry. So I believe that um, the apostles were the ones who were uh, miraculously given this ability to speak in other languages and proclaim the gospel. And the very first thing that Peter says to all of those people there is, let this, me, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. So what was going on is that when they were speaking in all these different languages, in verse 12, it says that all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. And so uh, people didn't understand what was going on. Some were mocking them. And Peter says, let me tell you exactly what's happening. Verse 15, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. So um, the time where people drank and, and it was common to drink wine uh, because they didn't have uh, good clean water like we do. But that was later on in the day for lunch, for dinner. And uh, so it was preposterous to think that, that these apostles were drunk. And so um, Peter addresses that right off the bat. But then he says in verse 16, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Now, a couple things here. One is the fulfillment of prophecy. So what were the scriptures at that time? It, they were what we call the Old Testament. The New Testament had not yet been written. So Peter, as Jesus had done, and as John the Baptist had done, went back to the Bible and, and said, look, this is um, prophecy of what is to come. And he, so he's showing that what is occurring in the, in the Holy Spirit bringing about this miraculous action of the apostles speaking in different languages. This is what had been prophesied by Joel. The other thing to notice is that in verses 17 to 21, Peter, he quotes Joel. He, he actually speaks the words of Joel which are from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. So this, this shows the pattern of, of Christian proclamation, that, that those who carry out the office of the ministry are not free to, to speak their own views, their own ideas, but they must preach uh, what the scriptures teach. And so... In, in, in every worship service, uh, the, the, the scriptures are read, and then the proclamation, the, the preaching, is based on, on the Bible. And so th this sermon in chapter 2 is often thought of as the first Christian sermon, and it really is uh, foundational for all Christian proclamation. In verse 17, he then quotes Joel, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall, see, shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days... I will pour out my spirit 
and they shall prophesy. The first thing to note about Peter's uh, use of Joel is that he, he, he actually changes the words that Joel uses. In, in Joel chapter 2, he says, And afterward, I, I will uh, pour out my spirit on all flesh. Peter, uh, seeing that the day of Pentecost is the fulfillment of this prophecy, changes that to, in the last days it shall be. So what was the prophecy all about in, in Joel chapter 2? Uh, we're, we're not exactly sure when Joel uh, was alive and when he was prophesying. It, it, it could have been in the 9th century, 8th century. It could have been a little later than that. Nevertheless, uh, Joel was speaking to the people of God who continued to, uh, to uh, trust in, in other gods and not trust in God. And so the book of Joel is a pretty intense call to repentance and a, a lot of judgment of God. But as always, God is merciful. God's uh, call to repentance, his, his bringing about judgment on, upon his people is actually his mercy because he wants them to, to repent. And so there's the promise that God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, recognizes that this is a prophecy of the last days, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. So obviously, the Spirit came upon uh, the apostles on that day for a specific purpose, but the Holy Spirit is not limited just to those who make the proclamation. It is to, to everyone. God desires that all people shall be saved. And so the prophecy continues on. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, what do we make of this, especially in light of, as I was uh, stating before, the um, belief that the office of, of the ministry is carried out by the apostles and then pastors after them. The prophecy in Joel chapter 2 uh, uses apocalyptic imagery, and when we, we'll, we'll, when we get to the later verses here, we'll, we'll see more of that. But apocalyptic imagery is, is uh, interpreted incorrectly if it is interpreted as these exact details will come about in, in the exact way that they are described. Probably the best example of that is the book of Revelation. Um, there are other places in the scriptures like the book of Daniel, book of Ezekiel, and then even uh, our Lord himself in Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, and Luke 21 where Jesus has an apocalyptic discourse. And the, whenever you're dealing with apocalyptic language in the Bible, you have to be careful and interpret it according to uh, what kind of language is being used, which is apocalyptic. And understand that it's one, it's very broad, Two, it's looking into the future. And three, it's meant to describe things in a way which, um, which does not describe the exact details, but rather describes an overarching theme. And the overarching theme here is that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on all flesh. Now, there, there's two instances, uh, there, there may be more, there's two that come to mind, where this kind of idea of, wouldn't it be great 
if if everyone had this um, had this power and authority to 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 prophesy. One was when uh, Moses um, was overextended in in his work as as the prophet of the people of Israel, and so God uh, appointed seventy elders, and they were given um, the ability to prophesy. And there were a few other people that continued on. And Moses said, "Wouldn't wouldn't it be great if everyone had this ability?" But uh, clearly, God did not design it that way because those people were no longer able to prophesy. The other one is Jeremiah 31, where it's, again, a prophecy into the future of um, everyone, no one will have to teach one another because everyone will have the word of God written upon their heart. So this is looking to the time where we will no longer be in need of being called to repentance and because we will all know perfectly. And of course, that is uh, not in this lifetime. It's, it's when we get to heaven. So the other thing about this is if those who take this as your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, old men, dream dreams on my male and female servants, they will prophesy. If, if, you, if you interpret that as saying that this happened and that these things need to happen, then you also have to say the rest of it in verses 19 through 21 about the signs and the wonders. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Verses 19 to 20, or yes, and, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. Now these uh, details here are much more familiar to us as, as apocalyptic language. And Luke, the author of this book, gives no indication that these particular de details occurred on that day of Pentecost. Now, uh, there was fire. The Holy Spirit appeared to them as of, uh, of tongues of fire, but there's no indication that there was there was blood and vapor of smoke, that the uh, sun turned to darkness and the moon to blood. So what are we to make of this? We, we are to understand that the prophecy of Joel was an apocalyptic prophecy and apocalyptic language, apocalyptic prophecy is not to be understood as being fulfilled in those actual details uh, being brought about in those actual ways. And again, the book of Revelation is probably the best example of that. So here's the thing. If, if you interpret the, the details of verses 17 to 18 as actually having occurred or going to occur, then you have to take those details of 19 and 20 to having occurred or must occur. So my interpretation of this is, I believe, consistent with the testimony of the book of Acts and also the rest of the New Testament that, <clears throat> one, these things in this prophecy of Joel will ultimately be fulfilled on the last day when we're in heaven, uh, well, on the last day and then when we get to heaven. And two uh, is, is the day of the Lord, which is not one day because there are multiple, uh, multiple designations in the Bible of the day of the Lord. So on the one hand, um, it's the day when, when Christ Christ, 
became a human being. On the other hand, it's the day he, he uh, suffered on the cross. On the other hand, it's this day, Pentecost. On the other hand, it's the last day when, we, when he will return again in glory. So this prophecy, Peter is saying, is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, but it's not uh, fulfilled in its, in its fullness, shall we say. That will happen on the last day. So that's why he concludes, well, he doesn't cl conclude, Joel concludes in, at the end of verse 20, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. Then, uh, continuing with the prophecy of Joel, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the prophecy began in verse 17. <clears throat> I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And it concludes in verse 21. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So two things. One is, who is the Lord? Well, obviously in the book of Joel, it was Yahweh. It was God. At the end of Peter's sermon in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, he is going to say in verse 36 that Jesus is Lord. So the way that Peter is saying that this prophecy of Joel is fulfilled is in the person of Jesus Christ, who is God and who is Lord. And that the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh. Therefore, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy of, of the Old Testament that, that God desires that all people should be saved. Not just the Jews, not just the, the, um, the descendants of the Israelites, but of the Gentiles as well. That is everyone who's not Jewish by, by birth. So it, salvation is for everyone. And calling upon the name of the Lord, that's what really... Uh, Peter is going to devote the rest, of the, ser the rest of the sermon to. How is it that one comes to, to call on the name of the Lord and be saved? So this is a great uh, sermon, and it begins in the way that every Christian sermon needs to begin, and that is with Scripture. It needs to be a proclamation of the Word of God and it needs to be a proclamation of not only the law, which convicts us of our sins and drives us to repentance, but also of the gospel of the salvation won for us in Jesus Christ, which uh, both of which things Peter is going to make abundantly clear in his sermon in Acts chapter 2. So that is uh, the next part of the day of Pentecost, the beginning of Peter's sermon. Let us close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great and awesome day of the Lord. We thank you that it is fulfilled in your Son, who not only has come, who not only has sent his Spirit, but who also will come again on the last day. We pray your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, to convict us of our sin, to bring us to the knowledge of Jesus as Lord, to uh, strengthen and sustain us in that faith. And we pray all of this in your Son's holy name. Amen. I pray the Lord's peace be with you. Go in peace.